Hey everyone, how's it going? Like Jonathan said, my name is Nick Hill. I work on the research team at CB Insights. Uh, and before I dive into all the stuff happening in blockchain today, just a quick show of hands. How many of you own a cryptocurrency? Wow, that's a lot of people. All right, and how many of you bought a cryptocurrency six or more months ago? All right. Um, so if you don't know exactly what I'm talking about, uh, today I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the trends happening in the crypto world and the blockchain uh, universe. So to start, two years ago, the full market cap of cryptocurrencies was about $3.7 billion. Now let's fast forward two years. The market cap for cryptocurrencies is now $100 billion. So you all can do the math, but that's a pretty crazy jump in just two years. So for all of you that said you bought it six or more months ago, congrats, dinner's on you. And now the, the market cap is actually not just concentrated in Bitcoin anymore, but actually a wide variety of different cryptocurrencies like Ethereum. And the second shift that's really important is that the conversation has actually shifted past just the cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, and now actually talking about the underpinning technology of blockchain itself. So here you can see the CB Insights Trends tool, which monitors media chatter and interest. And you can see that around when the Bitcoin spike happened, there was a lot of talk about it. But nowadays, there's almost equal amounts of talk about blockchain as well as Bitcoin itself. And corporates are taking notice about this. So Abigail Johnson, CEO of Fidelity Investments, talks about how this technology is not just going to change how transactions are done, but actually can re-architect a lot of these spaces in their entirety. And it's now extending past financial services. We're seeing it in any other centralized area, like marketplaces, and even the internet itself. And Fidelity's actually been pretty involved in the blockchain space and has some projects in their own R&D labs. And so what is it exactly about blockchain that makes it so potentially disruptive? So first, it's immutable, it's tamper-free, and so there are a lot of implications for fraud and cybersecurity. It's distributed, so it's powered by a wide network of different nodes that are uh, tr uh, monitoring the transactions. And there's consensus, so decisions are actually made without a centralized authority. And so once you combine those aspects together, you have what we call an internet of value, where these digital assets uh, are unique, they're immutable, they're secure, and they're scarce. And so now you can see things like digital currency, like Bitcoin, which has an implicit value and can actually be used to transact on the blockchain itself. You have property, you understand who understands how much of what and what's happening to a given property at a given time. And then you have, there's an identity aspect. So uh, we talked a little bit about in some of the panels yesterday, but basically it's you're able to have unique identifiers that are not attached to a centralized authority. So it's like having a social security number, but it's not attached to any central government, for example. And so who are the people that are actually making the blockchain space a reality today? So when we looked in the CB Insights database, we saw that there was more than $550 million invested across 130 deals in 2016. But that was just equity investments. And so now we're seeing a lot of blockchain companies actually raise money through ICOs, which are initial coin offerings, which a lot of these companies basically are issuing out tokens that people buy uh, with, the, with the premise that those tokens will become more valuable over time as the network becomes more valuable. And so as you can see, and that actually is uh, bypassing equity, traditional equity investment that you might see for some of these early stage companies. And so here you can see that it's actually sort of competing now with the amount of VC investment we see in the space. And we took a preliminary look at uh, this quarter and ICOs have actually surpassed VC investment right now. And so startups in the blockchain space are attacking a wide variety of areas. So initially we saw startups working in things like wallets and exchanges, which are sort of the primary use cases, but now we're starting to see a lot more specific applications in places like distributed computing, distributed storage, or even more enterprise specific applications like healthcare or capital markets. And it's not just startups, but corporates themselves are also getting involved. So they're developing their own blockchain consortiums, they're creating in-house standards or launching their own projects. And here we actually see that there's sort of two different approaches to blockchain. There's the approach of using private blockchains to eliminate a lot of the inefficiencies in the back office. And then there are public blockchains which are trying to reform how the transactions are actually done in their entirety. So here we see two different uh, ways of approaching this technology. 
And there's good reason for these projects to start taking a high gear. I talked a little bit about this before, but the market cap for these cryptocurrencies has gone up uh, quite a bit. And also the number of transactions that are actually occurring on the blockchain itself is also increasing in volume. But even though the market cap has increased quite a bit, it's important to remember that this is still relatively small. So compared to other stores of wealth or places where financial transactions happen, uh, all the cryptocurrencies are much smaller. And so that's what's being built today. And what are the implications for this kind of technology going forward and looking tomorrow? So as the technology and the infrastructure layer for blockchain is built out, we're starting to see more use cases for decentralization in other industries. So everything from music to asset management to identity to uh, monitoring land titles, we can expect to see more and more applications being built out. So one of the things that has been uh, pretty hot recently is the idea of smart contracts. So in really simple form, that basically just means uh, getting earnouts when transactions are recorded and verified on the blockchain. And so as a lot of industries start moving to smaller and smaller transaction sizes, uh, something like blockchain becomes a really attractive option because it's fast, it's secure. Uh, and you can uh, track it very quickly. So we're seeing this in cases like insurance, for example, as we move towards pay-as-you-go insurance or payments through micropayments, uh, in digital property and copyright, so for example, the way um, music royalties are paid out, um, and even in uh, supply chain, so just monitoring how things are moving in the supply chain and earn out space on different milestones that they're hitting. So there are a lot of different applications as, these, as the transactions themselves actually become smaller. And so you guys may be wondering, what do centralized governments think about these decentralized processes? Well, it's sort of a mixed bag. So some countries are trying to stop it outright. Some countries are trying to issue their own digital currencies. Other ones are trying to figure out how they can be regulated sensibly so that these projects can move forward. And the SEC has taken notice of these unregulated markets. And just like with any other technology, there are always going to be some bad actors. So like we talked about with the initial coin offerings earlier, some people are raising money through these initial coin offerings and just running off with them. But the SEC has taken notice of this and are trying to figure out ways that they can sensibly regulate and, um, and monitor the space. And so even though there are bad actors in the spaces, there are also a lot of potential benefits. So Chris Dixon from uh, Andreessen and Horowitz puts this really well. Uh, those tokens and initial coin offerings that I talked about before actually provide a new way that we can incentivize people to start contributing and using uh, a lot of these projects from the get-go. So that actually incentivizes people to contribute to these open protocols and open networks in a way we never could have sort of imagined before. And so one surefire way to stop progress in this space is dropping a regulatory hammer or letting the cryptocurrency and Bitcoin community scale without any sort of uh, plan on how they uh, plan to architect these systems. The ways that we can sort of progressively understand and monitor and regulate these spaces is by understanding how private and public blockchains should be working together with one another. How can we uh, issue coins to the general public in a way that's safe for investors to get involved? And just generally, how can blockchain be rolled out in a way that's societally beneficial? So I know that was a lot of information at once, but so what are the key things that people should be thinking about when they approach this space? Well, the first thing is that this is still really early days, so even just understanding what parts of your business are susceptible to decentralization or could be uh, helped out by decentralization in blockchain systems is a good place to start. And then what flavor of blockchain makes the most sense for you? Should you work with one of the consortia and these private blockchains? Should you uh, operate on the public blockchain? Or even does a blockchain solution make sense for you from the beginning? So um, that's basically some of the thing, the general trends happening in the blockchain space. And we talked a little bit about blockchain la at last year's Future of FinTech with Fred Wilson about some of the things happening in this space. And here's what he had to say about corporate involvement in the blockchain space. I also think that uh, a lot of these financial services companies, um, you know, are, you know, they're, they're just like, oh shit, we got to get some of this blockchain, you know, like, how do I get some of this blockchain? Need some block um, I, need, I need some, I need some blockchain, you know, and so they're like, Jones and, yeah, exactly. I mean, those numbers are astounding, right? Like literally all the money that went into this sector from 2010 through 2014 went in from 
angels and, um, you know, uh, right. Bankers banker would mention that. Like, right. And then now, now it's all like, it's all the financial services companies are all in right. now all of a sudden, right? It's like, honestly, it's time to get the fuck out for a while, right? When that happens, because that's like the dumb money showed up, right? It's like, oh, fuck, the dumb money showed up. <laughs> time to get out of here. So how do you prevent yourself from being dumb money? What are the things that are happening in blockchain today? Hopefully the panel will talk a little bit about that. I'm going to hand it back off to Jonathan to introduce some of the speakers. So thank you.